Welcome to the UNEPFI Global Roundtable and welcome to this high-level dialogue titled The Role of Regulators in Delivering a Sustainable Financial System. For this high-level dialogue, I'm joined by two eminent leaders driving the sustainable financial regulatory agenda. Je Jeff Summeray is an executive board member at the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority, APRA. Jeff is a member of the executive committee of the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, and importantly for our discussion today, he chairs the UNEP Sustainable Insurance Forum. So thank you, Jeff, for being with us today. We're also joined by Frank Elderson, who is the executive director at BNB, the Dutch central bank. Frank holds a number of strategic chairing positions in the sustainability arena. He's been a chairman of the Dutch Sustainable Finance Platform since 2016. Since 2018, he's been the chair of the NGFS, a network of central banks and supervisors for greening the financial system. And last but really not least, Frank is a member of the supervisory board of the European Central Bank. And a week ago, the Eurogroup, Frank, I, I, I uh, had supported your candidacy for the position of a new member of the ECB's executive board. I understand this is in progress, but congratulations, nevertheless. Thank you, join, uh, for, uh, Frank, for joining us. Sure. Um, we're here to discuss how the finance system is responding to some of the greatest international and inter intergenerational responsibility that is to drive global economies and societies to manage the carbon risk, to store biodiversity, to manage water, water scarcity, and all of that while maintaining and improving societal outcomes. And so we are here to discuss the great momentum that's building up from the finance regulatory arena. In previous panels, we heard that both sustainability climate targets can drive innovation in the finance industry, and regulators can help build the frame for bold action and to accelerate that action. So regulation is a powerful force. Like businesses, regulators recognize that sustainability issues can be a source of material financial risk that can impact both firms, real economy sectors, as well as the stability of the financial system more broadly. Some jurisdictions such, such as in the UK, the EU, China, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, are taking policy and regulatory steps to enhance the role of the financial system in the low carbon and sustainability transition. We have multiple countries developing or that have developed clear and ambitious roadmaps for sustainable finance. I understand, Jeff, this is the case in Australia. Um, and some of these initiatives are policy regulatory led. Some are emerging from the finance industry itself. But the point is that they're coming up with concrete steps to enhance market transparency. And some actually come up with very comprehensive regulatory plans, notably in the EU, that have the ability to impact both the private and the public sector. We heard of the low carbon benchmark regulations, the EU taxonomy regulation. And so essentially for the last five, six years, there's been a substantial increment of national, subnational, international policy and regulatory measures across insurance, banking and investments. Central banks in particular, Frank, are a driving force in connecting at the core climate and other sustainability challenges within the finance industry. So my first question goes to you, Frank. How much progress can we report on in terms of central banks integrating climate and sustainability risk within their supervisory and regulatory mandates. Well, thank you very much, uh, Elodie, and thank you for, for having me here. And great to see you here, uh, Jeff. Um, always uh, always a great pleasure uh, also cooperating. Uh, cooperating. Um, well, um, let me say this to start off with. The, the, um, contributing to the development of environmental and climate risk management in the financial sector uh, that is indeed what the NGFS, the Central Bank and Supervised Network for Greening the Financial System, um, has been working on since its inception uh, now uh, almost three years ago. Uh, and maybe to, 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 to say two or three words on the NGFS. Um, we started with eight central banks and supervisors uh, around the world, and now uh, we have um, 72 uh, members uh, scattered around in five continents, uh, 13 observers, and one, and this is maybe the most important thing, one shared conviction. And that is that climate change is a systemic risk, uh, threatening economies and financial systems 
around the globe. Um, and that central banks and supervisors, as guardians of financial stability, have both the mandate and the means and the obligation to do something about that. Um, so what are we doing? Together, uh, we are working to reduce the costly financial risks that climate change creates. Um, we have joined forces on analytical work. Uh, we share best practices in our large network and we publish reports uh, to exchange knowledge and to inspire others uh, on how to integrate climate and environmental risks into our core tasks. So directly to your question, how to anchor, if you like, risk management and risk reporting in financial regulation. First of all, I think it is important that we understand that a lot can already be done um, under the existing framework of the existing financial regulation. Um, you know, several reports that have been out there for, for the last years have shown very clearly that climate related risks are in fact drivers of what we would call the conventional uh, prudential risk types um, for both banking and, and I'm pretty sure also the, the insurance uh, sector. Uh, droughts, floods, wildfires, uh, but also transition policies of governments trying to do something about this, um, they all affect existing financial risk categories such as credit risk, market risk, operational risk, liquidity risk, uh, underwriting risk. Um, so that is one, one thing. There's already a lot that can be done under existing regulation. No need to change banking laws or banking supervisory laws. Um, if you are a supervisor not yet active here, you can start tomorrow by just understanding that these are drivers of conventional risk categories. Now, to further, maybe that's the second point I want to make uh, under this question, if you like. Uh, to further anchor the risk in financial regulation, uh, we need to know more how climate change affects the real economy and more about the transmission channels to these financial risk categories. And in order to be able to do that in a more sophisticated way, we need to improve the metrics and to bridge the data gaps. Um, lack of data uh, has been identified by the NGFS uh, in various of our reports as a crucial element uh, for effective climate related and environmental risk analysis. Um, and to bridge these data gaps, uh, the NGFS is now working on identifying what data is missing and to determine also whether um, and, and how it can be obtained and where, where it might be at, although not easily accessible. Um, and we also will be looking more closely into the transmission channels of environmental risk um, to the financial sector. So to wrap that up, lots can be done already under existing regulation. Lots should be done more, but um, we need um, better access to data and we are working on bridging these data gaps. Thanks, Frank. Um, and Jeff, I, as mentioned in the introduction, you chair the UNEP Sustainable Insurance Forum that is a global platform for insurance regulators. Can you tell us how insurers and uh, more specifically insurance regulators progress on this agenda around the integration of uh, management of risks of climate sustainability risks in their frameworks? Well, very thanks, Elodie, and, and good to be with you all on this call and, and with you in particular, Frank. And what we do in the Sustainable Insurance Forum is not dissimilar to what Frank has described from the banking side. Um, we're a group of about 30 insurance uh, regulators globally that are collaborating on building our understanding and appreciation of climate risk and how that maps within our mandates uh, as insurance regulators and supervisors and like Frank has outlined we find that there are many connection points with existing regulation but we've had to build those links for supervisors and insurance firms in some cases to understand how uh, those risks map back to existing obligation and we've done that in two ways we have produced two issues papers and the first was on climate risk more broadly for the insurance sector and the implications of that for supervisors. The second was on um, the insurance sector's adoption of the TCFD uh, framework. And we found that while most insurers globally thought that um, climate was a 
a significant um, risk for their business. Um, only uh, about a quarter of insurers uh, by number were actually doing something about that. And we felt uh, as insurance supervisors um, quite confronted by that and we put out a, a paper on that. And we're now bringing those two papers together in cooperation with the International um, and Global Standard Setting Body for Insurance, the IAIS. And we are mapping those risks back into a set of in what is called insurance core principles and these insurance core principles guide the way the uh, regulatory framework works for all insurers globally and so um, we see this as very significant because uh, what we want is globally consistent approach to a um, uh, an international sector and the way supervisors in one jurisdiction approach it is similar to others and we're achieving this in an application paper which will guide supervisory practice and that has been released for consultation in the next couple of months. Hmm. Okay, thank you. And, and to, uh, to give perhaps a more concrete example in terms of uh, what those papers recommend uh, to, the, to the insurance regulators, so Peter, look at on the Australian context, can you explain what that means for APRA, for example, for the Australian uh, Supervision Authority? Yeah, so in Australia, we are guided by the same, as an insurance supervisor, we are guided by the same insurance core principle. So when the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, comes into Australia and does what is called an FSAP, or a financial sector assessment process, which they do in all jurisdictions globally, you know, every, I guess, five to seven years, they will assess how we are supervising firms against those insurance core principles. And now having climate risk mapped into those insurance core principles, they will want to be in Australia, as they will be in many other jurisdictions, understanding how regulators are supervising uh, climate risk. Mm. Um, here in Australia, we have been working cooperatively, not only as a prudential supervisor, but with the conduct regulator ASIC and with the Reserve Bank, uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia. And we have formed amongst those three regulatory bodies a climate change working group in what's called the Council of Financial Regulators. And we have made sure that we have consistently signalled and set expectation to industry uh, over uh, how we see this as a material risk and our expectations. And we are pleased to see that industries responded very proactively and there are a number of industry initiatives which are now taking the lead on some of the issues that Frank has referenced around measurement standards, taxonomy, um, and working collaboratively with us as regulators to advance uh, the overall business community capability in this area. Mm -hmm. and, and where are we on... on mandating more transparency and, and disclosure within the financial industry. I understand, Frank, you need data, you need metrics to understand what's happening and, and potentially advise central banks on taking measures, the same for, for insurers. So, Frank, how, how is the transparency um, agenda going with central banks around climate risks? Right. Well, um, what I said earlier, um, the NGFS is looking into this. We now have a um, um, a work stream that actually looks at these uh, at these data. There's of course various jurisdictions, the European Union being one of them, that um, you know is 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 being very proactively uh, seeking to enhance also legislations in terms of non-financial um, 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 metric um, uh, the publications and the disclosure requirements. So there 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 is there is lots of action. Um, Maybe uh, now that you gave me uh, the floor to also make the step towards um, um, not just the management of risk, but also to see how we then can impact um, uh, the change to a more sustainable uh, financial sector and a more sustainable economy, if you like, uh, Elodie, uh, I could maybe elaborate a little bit on that as well. Um, as that was one of the I, things that I, you... I, I would love to, but I would also like to hear from Jeff about transparency sure. in Australia and how this is being taken up by APRA. Yeah, so w we have spent the last two to three years building engagement, understanding and, and regulatory nudge. We have made it very clear that uh, it is our expectation that 
the TCFD framework, particularly by our larger, more sophisticated firms, is adopted. And while we haven't mandated, we've taken a stance that if not, why not? So if you are not adopting this, you need to have a very good reason as to why you wouldn't do that. Now, that position has all been, also been taken by the conduct regulator. It's been um, uh, also referenced by the Reserve Bank. And a parliamentary inquiry into climate-related risks also referenced that um, the TCFD framework was the global standard which firms should adopt. And we've seen listing requirements for the Australian Stock Exchange and others. But uh, we are short, we've stopped short of mandating. Uh, but I think um, that is with good cause because some of the issues Frank referenced about uh, taxonomy, modelling um, and, and measurement standards still has a little way to go. But we will end up at a mandated state uh, in, in the many jurisdictions globally uh, in the not too distant future, is my view. Okay, thank you, excellent. And so indeed, Frank, moving towards uh, achieving carbon neutral economies, restoring our biodiversity and uh, achieving our sustainable development goals. Um, how does that how does that work for financial regulators? Because uh, you know, recognizing and acknowledging the utmost importance of the of a resilient financial system, we also see regulators that have started to focus measures and instruments on real economy outcomes. So going beyond risk management, how does that work for central banks and and regulators? Sure. Well, I think you know the natural starting point is of course. Um, risk management for us that is that is in our genes that's in our DNA that's in our statutes if you like so that's why we're, we're very start and actually that also in and of itself although it starts with risk management um, has an impact um, um, uh, you know there's many examples of us doing research at, at, at you know at the banks being supervised um, looking at risks and then banks seeing the opportunity side of that same coin and then you know visiting their, their clients and changing things um, in, in a more greener way uh, for example in, in, in commercial real estate is a, is a very clear example of that um, uh, but more generally by having a better uh, risk assessment better asset valuations in terms of um, of, 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 of environmental risks and, and climate risks um, um, this will lead to um, to these uh, risks be, being managed better and that in the end will make uh, money flow from less green to green that is the first thing that uh, that i would like to say um second still on 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 on, on risk and pricing is a carbon price it, it would of course tremendously help uh, if uh, if there were to be an ever increasing um, um, if, if possible, more international, meaningful carbon prices, um, uh, having an ever broader scope of economic uh, activities and sectors. Um, and um, what we talked about uh, before, a disclosure framework that goes with that, that would help a lot. That is maybe the first category of, 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 of aspects. Second, and I think Jeff already um, very well explained it, uh, but uh, to just uh, add a little bit to that, uh, the convening power. Convening power that uh, central banks and supervisors have, uh, just like uh, you know the UNEP um, FI today has bringing all these people uh, now watching us uh, together. Uh, that is something that central banks and supervisors uh, can do and do. Uh, within uh, the Netherlands, um, since 2016, uh, I chair what we call this platform for sustainable finance, in which we bring together, uh, very much like uh, what Jeff said in Australia, uh, the private sector, the uh, public sector, um, uh, also um, uh, in universities, um, uh, lots of working, uh, work, working work streams and working groups, um, digging into uh, the various uh, themes and details uh, of this work, and um, us not. Uh, being able, as you uh, put it very well, uh, Jeff, not being able to to mandate and to to oblige financial firms to uh, to take certain actions, yes, on the risk side, but not on the impact side. But by using that convening power, by uh, discovering, if you like, together the various possibilities there are, um, we can certainly help uh, to uh, to bring this issue uh, further. And then the third. Uh, very shortly, but is leading by example in terms of literally as central banks putting our money where our mouth is. So we have our own portfolios and um, uh, and actually within the NGFS we did a report last year. We're now updating this report. This will come out uh, very shortly. 
uh, in which we uh, looked very carefully at the various policies that central banks do in terms of their own pension funds, in terms um, also of um, their own funds, and to see whether there can be a shift from um, um, investing uh, responsibly to investing uh, with a clear uh, view into impact. And the first data that we are getting in um, is from this uh, survey among all the members uh, is that indeed there is such a shift. This goes maybe slowly, uh, but there is clearly such a shift and I hope that we will be able to, uh, to, um, to make that more visible in the, um, in the upcoming publication. Thanks. And uh, thank you very much, Mike. And, and Jeff, I mean, in Australia, um, and we heard that on previous panels, CBUS is one of Australia's largest superannuation funds. It recently joined this UNEP Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, which equals to them committing to aligning their portfolios with a net zero pathway before 2050. And today, actually, they launched their targets for, they announced their targets for decarbonization to 2025. Is that something that APRA is supporting and is um, is is also aiming to uh, further drive in Australia in terms of supporting insurers and investors align their strategies with climate and, and other sustainability goals? Well, absolutely. I mean, CBUS is an app-regulated entity. Um, and we are seeing, and, and I think it's important that you draw that out as we've talked about banks and insurers, but actually investors and the weight of money is really one of the huge movers on this whole agenda. And investors get it, and they get it that you um, you can't have a successful business on a dead planet. And you know, environmental sustainability and commercial sustainability are one and the same things. And we have um, we've borrowed enough from the world's natural resource, and we now need to put put back. We need to regenerate. We need to have a more sustained uh, and sustainable world. Otherwise, commercially and from an investment perspective, uh, from a uh, credit perspective, an insurance perspective, we are facing risks um, uh, about that uh, sustainability. And if you think about us as uh, supervisors and regulators, we have a stability mandate and each of these elements are, are threats to that stability. And so um, I think there's a great nexus and a synergy between environmental sustainability and business sustainability and firms like CBUS are realising that. Mm. And uh, I'm being told by uh, the secretary that I have five more minutes. Uh, do, you, do you have five more minutes, Frank and Jeff, if I have one more question for you? Sure. sure. Thank you. I, uh, I'm curious to know about how regulators, I mean, and including central banks and from a prudential regulation, are potentially looking at tools that direct sustainable finance strategies towards actual outcomes such as taxonomies and, and how and whether this is something that uh, financial regulators like the networks to drive or central banks or APRA are looking to develop and or use. Frank, if you want to go first. Okay, sure. <laughs> we, are, we are both being modest. Uh, well, you know, the uh, the NGFS will not be um, uh, in itself in the driver's seat in, in terms of drafting taxonomies. Uh, that is something for others to do. But we do uh, see that this is extremely important. So in, in our various reports, also in our very uh, the first report, we have actually called for uh, for taxonomies to be drafted. For, to We welcome those that are there. The Chinese started with this uh, some time ago already. There's now, of course, the EU taxonomy. There are some others out there. Uh, we asked for them to be as compatible as possible. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, it's of huge importance that we have a common vocabulary that we can then use uh, in uh, in many, many ways. In, uh, in in risk management, although there it would be helpful if I just focus a little bit on the um, the European, the EU taxonomy, that it's not just a, um, a vocabulary or a categorization, if you like, of various shades of green, but we should also have uh, the other side of the coin, the, the various shades of non-green, if you like. Um, so there is further work to be done. Uh, there is the possibility also in the regulation to actually do that after some years. So uh, I would uh, encourage uh, the, uh, the lawmakers to, to actually uh, take on that work and, and, and do that. It would help in terms of, um, uh, of risk management. 
Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it would be very interesting also to see whether central banks in their own risk management, also in their monetary policy operations, can, uh, can be using uh, this taxonomy. So I think that this is a, a very um, important piece of the puzzle. Thank you, Jeff. How is, the, how is that in Australia? Yeah, um, I think as referenced earlier, what has been very pleasing um, is this community uh, and collaboration between a range of different stakeholders. Now, sure, there has been a regulatory nudge on these issues, but we have seen in Australia a number of bodies emerge, uh, one called ASFI, the Australian Sustainable Finance Initiative, which is a very broad coalition of banks, insurers and pension funds, which is mapping out a sustainable roadmap for the financial services sector, uh, the investor group on climate change, which represents all the big pension funds, uh, like one of the ones you mentioned earlier, uh, has been very active in, in developing capability of the investment sector. And to the issue of taxonomy, a, uh, again, a group of banks and insurers have come together on their, their own accord uh, called um, the Climate Measurement and Standards Initiative, the CMSI initiative, and they are developing a set of taxonomies as it specifically relates to some of the Australian circumstances around natural catastrophes and, and, and getting that being voluntarily adopted by the insurers and the banks. Interesting for us as regulators, we will next year do a vulnerability assessment of both physical and transition risks for the major institutions in Australia influenced by the work that Frank and his team is doing on the various different scenarios and we'll apply those scenarios working collaboratively with some of these industry-led um, uh, groups like the uh, CMSI, uh, Climate Measurement and Standards Initiative uh, and the Australian scientific um, uh, community to develop the scenarios so that we are, are looking at these issues as uh, again, a community of capability building as opposed to a pass-fail test that a regulator might apply. Um, climate, uh, while uh, it has been around for a long period of time, the realisation and the development of this, these disciplines and the nuances around taxonomy, modelling, uh, scenario stress testing is quite new. And so um, the more people we can have in the tent uh, on this, the better. Okay, thank you. And so maybe one last question from, from me to you. And you've already touched a little bit on, on that, but essentially I'm interested in you as chairs of, uh, both of you as chairs of international networks, of financial regulators. Where do you see the next steps in terms of uh, accelerating the regulatory agenda, support the finance industry line with policy sustainability goals, but also in terms of bringing coherence internationally? And I think you've already touched on the second point, but perhaps the first in terms of accelerating the regulatory agenda. Frank. Um, okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that um, uh, a couple of things, I'll be very sure. I hope that uh, both uh, both our organizations will still grow a little bit in uh, so that, you know, the more uh, supervisors, uh, both on the banking and the insurance side, the more central banks join this effort, the better there is. There is still some that uh, that um, that you know could very much be encouraged to also um, participate. That's one. Two, I think that it is really time for the uh, standard-setting bodies because you know the, the NGFS is of course a network of the willing, uh, but the standard-setting bodies should step uh, um, up to the plate and participate. There is now uh, precipitate. I should say there is now um, also a task force on um, climate-related risk uh, under the uh, Baal committee that I co-chair uh, together with Kevin Styro of the um, Federal Reserve of New York. So there is work being done. Some of the uh, other um, standard setting bodies are certainly also active. So I think that's very good. But um, this work uh, needs to be uh, done um, as quickly as possible. Um, and I think that we should um, go beyond climate. Um, you know, what we now understand from the transition from climate related risks to financial risk that these mechanisms, these the transition channels, they also hold uh, true for biodiversity loss, for water scarcity, for uh, resource scarcity, even for human rights abuses. So we can go much broader than that. And I think we should go much broader than that and look more holistically um, um, to the various SDGs, if you like, uh, as the, uh, the UN has done. Um, and the last uh, thing I want to say here is. We're going to be cut off in 20 seconds. Frank. There is there is great urgency. We should have done all this work after the Rome report in the 70s, and we did it. 
we lost half a century. We must do it very, very quickly in a very determined way. Thank you. Urgency is great as a conclusion. Thank you for your time, perspectives. Thank you for your leadership.